everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Susan Hack. Um, she was educated at Oxford and Cambridge, and she has a very distinguished career. Um, I'll just give you some of the books that she's published. Um, among those are Philosophy of Logics, Deviant Logic, Fuzzy Logic, Beyond the Formalism, Manifesto the Passionate Moderate, and others. Um, some of her books have been translated into Chinese, and also um, she has a book translated into Portuguese. Um, so her work is, is widely read. Um, she's been at, according to her website, nearly 600 speaking engagements. And she's a person of many talents, um, and she's also a person of many titles. So she is distinguished professor in the humanities. She's the Cooper Senior Scholar in Arts and Sciences. She's a professor of philosophy and also a professor of law. So please help me welcome Professor Susan Hack. Um, this is a big picture metaphysics paper. So Lewis Carroll was the obvious place to start. You know the walrus and the carpenter? Um, the time has come, the walrus said, to talk of many things, of shoes and ships and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. I think it goes on, and why the sea is boiling hot, and whether pigs have wings. Skip that part. Um, I wrote this paper as a result of an invitation to a big conference in Bonn, which was organized by an enormously energetic young man with a very fancy chair. He looked about 12, but my guess is he was probably in his early 30s. Um, and he had this big idea, there was going to be a new realism, and the conference was on the new realism. And I get this invitation, I really wasn't sure whether to laugh or cry. What? What? New? What? Uh, hang, hold on a minute. Why? Well, I started thinking about these issues in the 1970s. Um, the innocent realism I'm going to be developing here, I was starting to work on in the early 1990s. And it calls on ideas from Peirce, um, who in turn calls on ideas from Duns Scotus. Um, Peirce calls himself an extreme scholastic realist on the grounds that he thinks he's even more realist than Scotus was. So, okay. so there was no way I could promise these people in Bonn that everything I would say would be new. I have to say, look, I hope you just accept it if it's at least true. Even if it um, thinking back, I realized where it started for me was, you probably don't remember this, but there was a time, not really quite in my lifetime, but not long before, when you, you didn't do metaphysics. The positivists had shown it was meaningless rubbish. And when Klein and Strawson began doing metaphysics in the 1950s, this was kind of a shock. So I've been thinking about how, how metaphysics was revived in their work. Um, and because, I know, I know why, I had to teach this enormous class on epistemology and metaphysics. It lasted a year. And I thought, well, might as well use a big book. Let's use Carnap's Aufbau. Everything should be in there. The Logical Structure of the World. There's a nice modest title for it. So I was puzzling over Carnap's distinction between internal and external questions. I was thinking about that very strange paper of Quines and Goodman, Steps Towards a Constructive Nominalism. I don't know if any of you have read this. You know, it starts out, we don't believe in abstract objects. And it ends up saying, hmm, it seems to be very difficult to explain without appealing to numbers what it means to say there are more cats than dogs. Hmm. Um, at that point, I realized two ideas fell into place. Um, the first was in reaction, I think, mainly to Peter Strawson, whom I much admired, but I thought mistaken. I think metaphysics is about the world. It's not just about our language. It's not just about concepts. It's about the world. And I also came to think that the question of nominalism and realism is actually still very important, even though it's kind of unfashionable. 
Um, that quotation, the question on which each new-fledged masculine intellect likes to try its powers of disputation, comes from Chauncey Wright, and of course to me it's irresistible. Um, a little later I started thinking about realism versus relativism and then realism versus anti-realism. There was a time in Britain, and at this time I was teaching in Britain, you could not go anywhere and talk about anything but some graduate or student would say, excuse me, are you a realist or an anti-realist? <clears throat> what it meant was, are you with Davidson or are you with Dummett? And it took me a little while to figure out the correct answer, namely, no. <laughs> um, my conclusion here was, realism doesn't refer to a single thesis. It refers to an enormous family of theses, and the problem is to sort them out. And I began what turned into half a lifetime's work arguing against Popper that his defense of realism failed and that his three worlds metaphysics really didn't explain anything at all. Gradually, you know, sort of shaking off Quine's influence, you know, Quine says, don't multiply senses beyond necessity. I used to feel very guilty about this, no longer. I think Percy's distinction between reality, which is the word he uses for generals, kinds and laws, and existence, which is the word he uses for particular things, is actually very useful. I think he was correct in thinking that nominalism, in the sense of denying that there are kinds and laws, actually undermines the scientific enterprise. It would make it impossible. And this suggested to me how Quine's criterion of ontological commitment had created a false dichotomy which had messed up the philosophy of science ever since. We, we can go into this detail later if it happens to grab you. I'm on my way somewhere. Um, what's this false dichotomy? Either you have a nominalism that only allows the existence of concrete particulars, or else you have a pseudo-realism with abstract particulars as standing in for real generals. Okay. I think that's a big mistake, and that Quine had us all fooled for a long time. Me as much as anybody. So I began developing a theory I called innocent realism. Of course, I don't want to call my own theory naive. I hope it isn't. But I think it is innocent of a lot of epistemological accretions that some forms of realism require. Uh, the first brief statement was at the very end of a paper called Reflections on Relativism in 96. And it was amplified and refined in a paper called Realisms and Their Rivals in 2002. Uh, it was applied to the philosophy of science in my book Defending Science Within Reason in 2003. And I've been trying to apply it in philosophy of law since then trying to see how it would extrapolate whether the consequences still look plausible when you're talking about social norms. Um, here were the ideas that gradually gelled. First of all, realism stands urgently in need of disambiguation. By the way, um, it's amazing how the child is father to the man, the child is mother to the woman. My B. Field dissertation when I was yay high was about ambiguity. I knew it was important. I don't think I knew why it was important, but now I do. Philosophy is full of ambiguities. Um, different forms of realism share the idea that there's something that's independent of something about us. But what they disagree about is what it is that's independent of what about us. Um, so we could disambiguate using that very useful expression, as opposed to. I think it ought to be a logical connective, but we don't have one. We don't have a squiggle for it. Um, perceptual realism, as opposed to the representative theory, or the idea theory. Physicalism, dualism, pluralism, neutral mindedism, as opposed to subjective idealism. There may be unknowable truths, as opposed to the true is the justifiably assertable. That's the Davidson versus Dummett axis of this. Realism about universals, or as I would prefer to say, generals, as opposed to nominalism, conceptualism. The various versions of scientific realism, of which there are dozens as far as I can tell, 
as opposed to instrumentalism, to constructive empiricism, to certain forms, but not all, social constructivism. Um, metaphysical realism, which grew capital letters thanks to Putnam, as opposed to conceptual relativity or other forms of relativism. Um, of course, relativism is even more hideously ambiguous than realism is. Uh, it's clear that any form of relativism, you know, I remember when I first started to make this table, it was almost embarrassing, except it was funny. Um, a graduate student sidled up to me. You know how graduate students sidle up when they want to ask you something, but they're afraid to a bit? Dr. Huck, uh, what is relativism? I know Dr. Siegel's against it, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, there's the thesis that something is relative in some sense to something else. And I started drawing on the board. Oh, my god. Oh, I've suddenly disambiguated it. So I'm going to set aside the anthropological forms to focus on the philosophical. And I take that to be distinguished by what relative to means is makes sense only relative to, not varies depending on, which is the anthropological form. And then, of course, there are all sorts of things that you might think were relative to something else. Um, these were as many as I could get on one slide. Um, meaning, reference, truth, metaphysical commitment, ontology, reality, epistemic values, moral values, aesthetic values, I could might be relative to language, conceptual scheme, theory, paradigm, version, depiction, description, culture, community, individual, dot, dot, dot. Um, of course, not every possible permutation is a realistic possible form of relativism, but a lot of them are. And actually, even this quite simple apparatus, which, no kidding, I first arrived at by just scribbling on the board because the graduate student was pressing me, you can distinguish various people's positions in a way that's actually quite helpful, I think. So, Rorty's claim that truth is whatever can overcome conversational objections is 3A. Quine's thesis of ontological relativity is 2C. Worf's thesis of linguistic relativity is 4C. Um, Putnam's conceptual relativity is either 5A or 5B. It's not quite clear to me which. Um, Goodman's pluralistic irrealism is 6E. Um, epistemological relativism is, well, Anis's is 7G. Uh, 7D is the closest I can get to Kuhn, for example. I think I'll go back to the table so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. You can actually distinguish different forms of relativism as held by actual people um, using this apparatus. What I was trying to do when I did this was to distinguish among the many forms of relativism those that are true from those that are false or perhaps even self-defeating. I think some forms of them are true and some forms of them are false and some of those false forms are self-undermining. And, of course, the goal with respect to realism was to distinguish those that offer real insight from those that overstate or overreach. Leading me to develop a new theory I called innocent realism. I just typed in innocent realism on Google Images. And that came up. <laughs> I think it's cute. Um, here's the call. First of all, Metaphysics is a legitimate enterprise. I have absolutely no lingering logical positivist scruples about doing metaphysics, none. Um, I grant, however, that metaphysics has produced some of the largest quantities of near unintelligible rubbish as any discipline in the history of humankind. I have a theory about why. I think it gets tangled up in unanswerable questions because you make a false presupposition somewhere 12 steps back and then you keep on asking the questions that follow from that presupposition and the ones that follow from the answers to those and those and those and those and by the time you've done this for 30 years it's a terrible job to go back to the place where you had the false presupposition in the first place. Okay. But of course that's the solution. Trace your steps back, disable the false assumption start again. 
Moreover, as I said earlier, metaphysics is about the world, and I think metaphysics depends on experience. I think it's an empirical theory. Um, but it doesn't require experiments. It doesn't require expeditions. It doesn't require exhumations. It doesn't require any of the recherche observations that the natural sciences rely on. No. What it requires is close attention to familiar experience, to things we all know, really. Okay, you'll notice me as I start developing the theory. And it's just appealing to things about the world that all of us know, but that we don't really pay attention to because it's just too obvious. Okay, first of all, the world of, in of innocent realism is one real world. Largely, but not wholly, independent of us, of our actions and our beliefs, but manifestly very heterogeneous, though also, I think, unified. But the sense in which it's unified is very hard to spell out. All right, it includes particulars and generals, natural objects, stuff, phenomena, kinds, laws. An enormous array of human and some animal artifacts. Beavers, dams, birds, nests, roads, bridges, houses, huts, hats, etc. It also includes mental states and processes, including our thoughts and our dreams. Our thoughts and our dreams are real. Um, God only knows what Freud would make of this. But when I was a small child, I had a recurring dream that I was being chased up and down the stairs of my uncle's house by a horse. Now, that's what I dreamt. I did not dream that I was being chased around the kitchen of my grandmother's house by an oversized chicken. It was my uncle's house, up and down the stairs, and it was a horse chasing me. So the dream was real, even though, of course, what I dreamt was. And then there are real social institutions, real social roles, rules, norms. And there are real human languages and other sign systems, musical notations, mathematical notations, blah, blah, blah. Theories, scientific, mathematical, philosophical, etc., etc. Works of history, works of art, criticism. And of course, myths, legends, works of fiction, the characters and places that figure in them. Um, one way of putting this is, um, in our little corner of the universe, the natural is overlaid by this dense mesh of both physical and intellectual and imaginative constructions of ours. Um, even this, I think, is still a bit too much like this view from New York. Um, I hope you can see it. California is a skinny sliver on the left edge. The idea is the view from New York is extremely parochial. Manhattan's really everything. Forget the idea. Well, so far my picture is a bit too much like that picture. My picture. Because we humans and the Earth are just part of a larger universe, a tiny part, which might actually itself turn out to be only one universe among many multiverses. I'm not competent to have an opinion about the likelihood that that theory will survive. But if it were to, then the theory would simply make these multiverses part of the one real world. Best picture I could find of them. I don't think. <laughs> I know that. Um, my account of the one real world I haven't only noticed if anybody cares, but if you were to look at the last paragraph of my paper on reflections on relativism, that contains a little statement of innocent realism. And it's taken me 15 years or more to spell out exactly what that paragraph meant. Okay, so I'm still working on it. Um, I use what I think of as the method of successive approximation. Start with something you're sure is true but of course it's vague. And then see if you can make it more precise without making it false. That was the way I wrote evidence and inquiry, using precisely that method. And I'm doing it again here in metaphysics. So, 
Uh, this method leads me to two very hard questions. What does one mean in one real world? And what does real mean in one real world? Um, if I can answer both of those questions, I'm significantly further forward than before. So, what does one mean? Now, the preliminary answer, there isn't more than one. There isn't, for example, a physical and a spiritual world. And Popper's talk of three worlds, or logicians' talk of many possible worlds, I think is not helpful if you take it literally. It might be helpful as a heuristic device. That's a different question. At the same time, I think the real world is unified. Um, this is not because I'm a reductionist. I'm not. Um, but. It's a, it's a way, first of all, of saying, look, the artifacts that we make, everything in this room, essentially, apart from the people, are constrained by the physical properties of the stuff we make them of. Um, my example is you can't make a working typewriter out of butter. Another example I used once was you can't make a pillar out of rock. But then I went to Oslo and they took me to the Contiki exhibition and guessed what? There was a stone pillow. So I had to give that example. And moreover, I think our beliefs and our hopes and our fears and so on are realized in physiological states of our nervous systems. I don't think they can be identified in those physiological states, but they are realized in them. What's real me? Well, it can't mean independent of us. That would mean that, that this isn't real, this isn't real, this isn't real, this is, that can't be right. That would exclude human artifacts. They're dependent on us, we make them. It can't mean mind independent, because that would mean that dreams and thoughts are real, and they are. We all know they are. No, what does real contrast with? It contrasts with fiction imaginary, a figment. Um, what's the difference? Well, an imaginary beast or a fictional character is as its creator or creators makes it. That's what makes it fictional, imaginary, and not real. So real, that's to say not fictional, means independent of what you or I or anyone thinks about it. This is the idea I have borrowed from Peirce, who in turn borrows it from Scotus. Interesting, because real is actually, relatively speaking, a new word. When Scotus gave his account of it, it hadn't been in circulation very long. Um, now, you may be puzzled. Um, Actually, now for a very long time, I was puzzled. I think I only cracked this fully, nearly fully, last week. Um, didn't I say that the run, one real world includes works of fiction and fictional characters? Well, yes, it does. Sure it does. You only have to sit in an airport and listen. People are talking about the soap opera they watched last night. These, these people, these, these characters are real. But these fictional characters are not real people, or real rabbits, or real hobbits, or whatever the book happens to be about. Perhaps rabbits doesn't do it for you. I'm sure you know what hobbits is about. There's a simply wonderful book, um, originally written for children, but just much too good to be left for the children. Richard Adams' Watership Down, which is sort of Pilgrim's Progress for Rabbits. Uh, it's really good, and it has moments of sheer Shakespearean low comedy. Great stuff. Well, okay, there really are fictional characters, but fictional characters aren't real. That's what I want to say. Uh, at which point you may say, ah, what the heck? Um, isn't this some sort of crazy minomianism? Um, well, actually, I don't think minom was as crazy as people. Russell Quine thought it was. But all I mean by it is, Middlemarch is a real work of fiction. 
and Dorothea Brooke is a real fictional character. But there never was such a place as Middlemarch, nor was there ever such a person as Dorothea. Okay, so there are real imagined people, but they are not real people. They are mental things. Um, this point um, is kind of interesting. When I gave this talk in Bonn, I got this far, and I had no idea I had a problem. And there must have been, what, a couple of hundred people in the room, and none of them noticed I had a problem either. And on the flight back, I suddenly sat bolt upright in my seat and said, ah, there's a problem. Eek. I think fiction comes in degrees. That's the first thing. Think of fish stories. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I went, I went fishing and I caught a fish and it was this big, and then next week it's this big, and the week after it's this big, and by the time I'm telling it to my grandchildren, it's this big. I think fiction grows out of the natural human, human way of narrating events, and the natural human tendency to embroider. But if fiction comes in degrees, and real contrasts with fictional, real comes in degrees. This was the step of modus ponens I failed to take in Bonn and took on the way home. Okay, you see? This is just one step of modus ponens. Fiction contrast with, fic with real contrast with fictional. Fictional comes in degrees, so reality has to come in degrees. And for a while I thought, ugh, ugh. Um, I must have argued myself into an inextricable hole. This is not acceptable. And then, no. I actually think it's true. Reality does come in degrees. Um, the example that comes to my mind is King Arthur, probably because when I was 17, I had to study Roman Britain, whether I liked it or not. And here's what I learned. Um, king Arthur, the King Arthur of legend, has one foot in reality. After the Romans left Britain, you know, they had to go back to Rome to keep, keep Rome safe from the barbarians. Yes? This leaves the colonies, including Britain, undefended. And people from the north of what's now Germany eyeing the island, thinking, hmm, OK, now we can go take it over. Well, there actually was a chieftain who pulled together the British tribes to fight off the invaders from what's now Germany. That's the origin of the King Arthur legend. All the stuff about the hundred knights and the round table and the sword and the stone and all that, that is embroidery by a 13th century poet called Geoffrey of Monmouth. So King Arthur exactly has one foot in reality in the person of this British chief and one foot in fiction in the poetry of Geoffrey of Monmouth. So he's kind of half real. Um, of course, innocent realism is a form of realism and it's metaphysical. But it's not metaphysical realism with a capital M and a capital R. Um, there's nothing in it about a fixed totality of mind-independent objects, which strikes me as a horrible idea. Mind-independent isn't what real means anyway. Um, object is a word, you know, it's, it's sort of, you know, it's the English word for thingamabob. So it's, its role is to be flexible, so counting them is a bad idea. Um, nor is there any hint in anything I've said of a privileged vocabulary in which there could be one true description of the world. Nothing like that. Rather, I'm denying that real means mind independent, and I'm happy to say there are many different true descriptions of the world in different and perhaps not always mutually intertranslatable vocabularies. Find my me. Now, how does this apply in the natural sciences? Well, I think scientific theories are normally either true or else false. Um, and I think that the goal of scientific inquiry is to discover the answer, that's to say the true answer, to whatever question is at issue. That's to say, I don't believe either instrumentalism or constructive empiricism is viable. 
Now, the argument for that would take a whole nother paper. Um, it's to do essentially with uh, my belief that there's not a sharp observational theoretical distinction, but a continuum. And I think that undermines both of these um, non realist positions. However, this isn't to say that scientists are seeking the truth in capital letters. It's only to say, if they're investigating whether P, then what they want is to conclude that P if P, and that not P if not P. That's all. Now, nor is it to say they always succeed in their own. I don't think they do. I think progress in the sciences is ragged, uneven, fallible, unpredictable. Real, but ragged, uneven, fallible, unpredictable. Of course, um, truth isn't enough for success. What science seeks is substantial, explanatory truths. And I believe explanation requires generality, that's to say, real kinds and real laws. But without real kinds and real laws, all you can have is descriptions of the world and not explanations of natural phenomena. Indeed, the whole concept of a natural phenomenon is itself general. Um, there are real kinds when I say it doesn't mean that over and above particular cats there is a kind, cat with a capital C in boldface. It means cats have things in common regardless of what we believe about them, which again is not to say cats are alike in every respect. Um, a lot of cats in my yard, a lot of cats in my neighborhood, every single one different, <coughs> and yet all of them run up the tree and then are terribly embarrassed because they can't get down properly. All of them do that wonderful yoga position where they're, they're, they're licking the inside of their hind leg. All of them jump the fence in the same manner. All of them hunt the same way and so on. Now, just as there's no guarantee of the truth of scientific theories, there's no guarantee that terms in the relevant science pick out real kinds. Um, a good vocabulary is a scientific achievement. Um, I once spent a happy few weeks looking into the history of the concept of DNA. It took about a hundred years from the first time anyone isolated the stuff to it being called DNA and us knowing not what the structure was, but what the composition was. That's an achievement, a vocabulary that fits the world right. Um, just to be clear, so to preempt some questions, I don't think kind terms are rigid designators. I think they have meanings, and I think those meanings grow as our knowledge grows. Moreover, I think the question, are there really books and trees and trees, or are there any molecules and atoms and whatnot? It's a crazy question. It's a false assumption. Chairs and books and trees consist of atoms, like a suite of furniture consists of a sofa and two armchairs whatever it consists of. In the social sciences, well, okay, I think there are not only natural kinds, there are also artifactual kinds. Chair, lamp, money. There are social kinds, money, marriage, law. Some of them are universal, some are only found in certain societies. Does anywhere except this country have marching bands? Very curious cultural phenomenon to a foreigner. Um, Germany. Germany, okay. Um, I only learned while I was writing this paper, this sort of tells you what I mean by metaphysics is about the world. In Costa Rica, they don't have street names and numbers. If you want to deliver a letter, you have to say two doors down from the pizza hut, or you know, some descriptive term. Well, I thought everywhere that had streets had street names. No, not true. Um, the challenge posed by social institutions, of course, is that they really do depend in part on what people in the society believe about. Um, for example, whether a currency is viable depends in part on whether believe, people believe it's viable. If people lose faith in it, it's worthless. If they'd rather have the wheelbarrow than the 50 million marks that you could put in the wheelbarrow, then the marks are worthless. Yes. Um, nevertheless, social institutions are real, as anyone who's ever been in trouble with the law can tell you, for 
example. Um, after all, you and I, we could print fake dollars in the basement. Steve, you want to try? We could print fake dollars in the basement. But it wouldn't matter if we believed till we were blue in the face that they were real money. They wouldn't be. Okay, so we need to distinguish between the brutally real, which is independent of what absolutely anyone thinks about it, and the real but socially constructed, which does depend in part on the beliefs of the people in the society concerned. So, brutally real, independent of what anyone and everyone believes about it. Real but socially constructed is independent of what you or I or any individual believes about it, but can depend on what some group of people believe about it. What about our beliefs? Oh, this, was, this was what drove them crazy in the ball. What about our beliefs? What about them? Well, we and our beliefs, I believe, are part of a natural world. But our beliefs are not simply reducible to brain states. They have three aspects intimately interwoven. Now you're getting a whole other paper in a bouillon cube. You know, we put this in hot water and it turns into a whole other paper. Um, there are multiform dispositions to behavior, verbal and non-verbal, which are realized physiologically in networks of First I said in the brain, but when I thought about it, I think, no, not just the brain. In the brain and the tongue, it's what you're supposed to say. And the arms and the legs, what you're supposed to do. You know, it, you, you see a saber-toothed tiger coming at you, what are you supposed to do? Run like hell. So this is realized in part in connections to your legs. And how are they identified? How do we determine what their content is? I think by reference to the use of words in the language of the person concerned and the relations of those words to things in the world. Okay, so the relation of my brain states to words in, well, English. Um, bilinguals make life a little harder, but not impossibly hard. Um, and to the relation of words in English to things in the world. That's what makes my beliefs about things in the world. As I put it elsewhere, it's all physical, but it isn't all physics. It's all physical. There's no spooky stuff, no Cartesian mental substance, no souls, no nothing like that. But it's not all reducible to physics, not in principle even all reducible to physics. Because to understand the content of people's beliefs, you have to go through this socio-cultural loop. In the philosophy of law, well, I'm still thinking, but I think legal institutions, laws, and rules are a subclass of social institutions and constitute a pluralistic universe in themselves. Just think about it. The US legal system, what does that mean? Well, there's the federal system, and then there are all the state systems, and then there's the military system, and then there's the system for Native American reservations. Yes? And then there are the relations of this system to the other common law systems of the world. And then there are the relations of those historically and contemporary to the civil laws, etc., etc. Enormous pluralistic universe. Um, these legal institutions, I believe, are local to a jurisdiction and a time and are brought into being by things people do. There would be no such things if there were people bringing them into being. Well, it could be Martians, but I use people loosely here. Um, by, for example, the writers of constitutions, by legislatures, by judicial interpretation, by parents pushing for laws to keep sexual predators away from schools, and etc., etc. I think legal truths are relative to a jurisdiction and a time. Um, I'll tell you some. Um, until January of 2004, Michigan law followed the Fry rule on the admissibility of scientific testimony. After that date, they followed the federal system, and they followed the case known as Daubert. 
This is a legal truth, but it's about a particular place and a particular time. Yes? Um, this doesn't mean I think truth is relative. I don't. But legal truths are relative. To suppose that it does mean that would be to confuse properties of particular truths with properties of truth. If you drop that slide in boiling water, you'll get another paper. I'll tell you about it if you ask me. Um, I think legal norms are conceptually different from moral ones and different in extension. And there are plenty of things which are morally iffy, which are not against the law. For example, buying your term paper from a commercial outfit that sells such things for a large sum. Yes, you all read that very shocking article in the Chronicle of Higher Education about the guy who made a living by writing other people's term papers, PhD dissertations. Um, and moreover, there have been some really morally very bad laws. Jim Crow laws in the South, for example, Nazi race laws. I think we can assess legal systems, therefore, as better, more efficient, more economical, more civilized, fairer. I very much doubt there's a unique best. That's a whole other story. I suspect there are so many dimensions that you probably wouldn't get a unique best one. You would get some better in some respects and others in others. Oh, does that make me a legal realist? Oh, dear. Trouble is, in legal philosophy, Realist means almost the opposite of what it means in philosophy, generally. Um, instead of contrasting with idealist, it contrasts with idealist. And it means, well, the, the famous line that's too good not to use is, it's the view that what the law is depends on what the judge had for breakfast. Well, I'm not that cynical. But I do think that what the law is does depend on what human beings do. Not only the judges, the writers of constitutions, the legislatures, the judges, yes, the pressure the attorneys put on the judges to go one way rather than another, the pressure people outside the system put on the system, and so on. In short, if you ask me what kind of a legal philosopher are you, I'd say, I'm a neoclassical legal pragmatist, though I can never hope to match Holmes's moustache got bigger and bigger as he got older and older. It's really magnificent. Um, of course, there are umpty um questions still unanswered, even if you put each of these slides in hot water and you've got the encyclopedia that might resolve. For example, about real as opposed to fake. I've actually been working on that lately. Um, about the place of moral or epistemic norms. I don't know what to say about them. I have no clue. Um, nor do I know what to say about the status of the entities posited in mathematics. I, I don't know yet. Maybe one day, but not yet. Um, but I think this confirms, actually, the development of a philosophical idea takes time. You know, it might begin with a simple idea. It did with me. It began with one paragraph. But it needs constant checking. It needs constant adaptation. Ooh, oh, wait a minute. Reality comes in degrees. How do we cope with that? <clears throat> oh, um, my definition of real gets in trouble over social institutions. How do we deal with that? And so on. And with not, what you get is not a new realism every year or every decade. So this was kind of my last protest slide in Bonn. And that was how I felt when I was done. <laughs> Thank you. As well, how does reality come in degrees? Oh, oh okay. Um, let me tell you first of all the argument by which I got there, and then the example I gave and how I would extrapolate it. Okay. Oh, the argument was uh, real contrast with fictional. Fictional comes in degrees. There are works of pure fiction, but. There aren't many, actually, that aren't set in some actual place, at least in some generalized sense. You see what I mean? I mean even the, the wildest science fiction is somewhere in some galaxy. Uh, 
if that's correct, then reality comes into Greece. And then my argument was, well, initially I was prepared to back away and say I must have made a mistake somewhere. And then I thought of King Arthur. King Arthur is, was, I'm not quite sure what tends to use, but neither a real historical figure entirely, nor a purely imaginary historical figure, because there are elements of this story which were actually true of someone who is the origin of this legend. And then a clear um, literary history in which you can track where the embroidery comes in and how we, how we got Camelot, the round table, the hundred nights, the soul and the sun and all that. And when I think about this, I realize that this is in, in some less dramatic way. Um, with much fiction, you have this kind of um, little sliver of reality that anchors it. Let me give you some examples. Um, did anybody, has anybody here read David Lodge's novel, Changing Places? Yeah, it's great, isn't it? Wonderfully funny. It's a camp tale of two campuses, British lecturer and American professor. American professor bearing more than a passing resemblance to Stanley Fish. Change places. Um, they come from two fictional universities in two fictional places. Professor Zapp, the American, comes from a small but populous state between Northern and Southern California called Euphoria. And he teaches at a public institution which is known as Euphoric State. So this is, this is a half real place because you know, you know it's on the west coast. Philip Swallow, the British lecturer, comes from the University of Rummage, which is uh, a sprawling industrial city of absolutely no charm or grace, situated in the, Briti in the English Midlands. Well, that's a real, the English Midlands is a real place, but Rummage is. Rummage is a weird mixture of, of Coventry and Birmingham, actually, as I happen to know. Um, so that's a sort of semi-real scenario. You, you see what I'm getting at? So, and then again, there are novels where real people show up. I think, for instance, you probably haven't read this one. Um, the Stanley Fish is real, isn't he? Oh, yes, Stanley Fish is real, yeah. He teaches at FIU, <laughs> right next door. Yeah, Stanley Fish is real. But it's not about Stanley Fish, it's a fictionalized Stanley Fish. Stanley Fish made his reputation, I believe, by writing a whole series of books about Milton. Professor Zapp made his reputation in a similar way by writing a whole series of books about Jane Austen. Right, so it's not, it's not the actual person, it's a fictionalized version. And it's a fictionalized town in a real spot on a real continent or in a real country. Or then there's, I'm thinking of another novel which you probably haven't read. Um, and it's sort of dated and it was always one I think of as a good bad novel. Um, it's a feminist novel by Zoe Fairbairn called Stand We At Last. It's, it's pretty bad but it's got its moments. You know, if everything horrible that can happen to a woman happens in this thing, absolutely everything. It's just, you're so depressed by the end. But in the middle of this novel, which is peopled by entirely fictional people, Christabel Pankhurst shows up. Well, she was a real feminist leader. And one of the two sisters to whom all these terrible things happen dies when she's crossing the Atlantic to go attend a feminist rally in the US, and unfortunately the ship she takes is the Titanic. So you've got this weird mixture of fiction and reality. Oh, that's what I meant. And once you look at it that way, it doesn't seem so radical after all. I mean, initially I was terrified. But Zap didn't exist, right? Zap, Zap is fiction. He's a fictional character. He's fictionalized. He's yes. probably based on a real person. That's right. And then that's partly based on purely imagination. And part, partly based, partly not based on imagination. Yeah. Partly yeah. imagination. Partly yes. Yeah. yes. Um, he's a, a type, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, so, by the way, a swallow. 
and I recognize myself in Swallow and ways which are really quite sobering. Um, but my point is, the places, I'm not, I'm not, not concerned with the people in that novel, I'm concerned with the places. Because I could tell you, you know, if you gave me a map of England, I could give you an area. Rummage has got to be somewhere in here. And if, I, if you gave me a map of the west coast of the US, I could tell you, euphoric, euphoria has to be between here and here somewhere. Um, and of course, the real Christabel Pankhurst, who shows up in Stand Me at Last, though there really was such a person, and she really was a feminist leader, did not have these interactions with these other people described in the novel, because the other people are purely imaginary. You, you see what I'm getting at? I'm, I'm, what I'm trying to get you to see is that while there is such a thing as pure fiction, most fiction is impure in one way or another. And the impurity means it's, it's got elements of reality in it. That's really all I meant. You've still got very I'm baffled. Totally baffled, yes. <laughs> okay. So nonfiction equals reality? Um, uh, not, it's kind of a category mistake. Okay. Um, not fictional means the same as real by my standards. Right? So if, okay, I'm using fictional in a broad sense. It doesn't just refer to novels. It refers to everything imaginary. So it refers to myths and legends and mythical beasts and um, you know, imagined animals. Once you start this, I'm afraid, you can't read a newspaper without leaping out of your chair electrified. I read a review a couple of weeks ago of, why do I always read this? I read this because the, the reviews in the Wall Street Journal about grown-up literature tend to be depressing. But the reviews of children's literature are often really fun. And I found a real beauty a couple of weeks ago. A book called Stardine Swim Across the Sky. What the hell's a stardine? It's a cross between a star and a sardine. And apparently this book is full of these creatures. Brain deer. Would you like reindeer, but with these big bulgy brains? And what else was there? Yes, slobsters, which are really sloppy lobsters. <laughs> Can't keep their bibs on or anything. It's very, very funny. So anyway, um, what, so I'm using fictional and real as contrast, but fictional in a broad sense. Okay, yes. but um, you're, you're referring to elements of the fictional works that represent things that have existed. Yeah, okay, I'm, ref I'm saying um, it's, it's a hard thing to do to articulate well because the phenomenon is very complicated. We, we, we imagine things, but we don't imagine things out of whole cloth. We, we imagine things out of our experience of real things. Stardines, for example, right? or brain deer. You can, you can see how you get there. Um, and I think, first of all, that fiction grows out of that natural tendency to embroider stories that we tell. You know, I'm sure we've, we've all done it. You, you know, I, I, I have what I'm sure is a false memory, for example, of <coughs> being told as a child to go feed the, the, the milkman's horse. Those were the days we had both milk, we had milkmen and the milkmen had horses. And I can remember when I was tiny being told, you know, you just put a piece of apple on your hand, hold it out flat, it won't hurt you. I think I remember this, but I'm pretty sure this is actually family fiction, which has been embroidered over the years. Do you know what I mean? About how scared I was of this harmless creature. And I'm like, <laughs> don't look, don't look. I think it's fiction, but it's fictionalized real event. I really was sent out to feed the horse, and I really was rather scared. And when you look at real works of fiction, you know, as opposed to, uh, I hate that stuff that's always about Sherlock Holmes. It just drives me nuts. Because real fiction is so much more fun than you know, just a few little stories about Sherlock Holmes. Um, you find this very interesting admixture of the little elements of reality and then imaginative embroidery. And I think this is where 
the real and the fictional meet. You see what I mean? So it's only the fictional elements in Sherlock Holmes. I don't know him well enough because I got so put off by this stuff. Okay. Um, look, I can tell you what the, look, let, let me take this, this feminist novel, right? Because it's a nice simple story. It's about two sisters. Um, one of whom does the expected thing and marries a successful guy. Uh, who infects her with a sexually transmitted disease because he's been playing around. And blah, 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 blah horrible things from, transpire from there. The other sister says, you know, I'm, not, I'm not doing that. that was a, that's a big disaster. I'm not taking that route. I'm going to be independent. I'm going to go to Australia and be a governess. And she goes off to Australia to be a governess and she finds herself as, as skivvy to a pair of absolutely brutal brothers on a sheep farm, one of whom she eventually marries on the grounds there's nobody else around. Right, it's really, really terrible, this story. And then she comes back to England and runs into Christabel Pankhurst and becomes a real feminist and is chaining herself to railings and going to jail and being false fed and all, everything terrible happens. But in the middle of all this, you get the real Christabel, Christabel Pankhurst, dressed in the real colors of the real you know, the suffragette movement, and holding demonstrations exactly as they did, and engaging in exactly the sort of, of um, I don't know how to, quite, how to describe this, controlled vandalism that they engaged in when you know, they wouldn't be given the vote until they finally won. Right? And it's based on truths about what happened to women who did things like throw bricks through windows. They would get sent to jail if they wouldn't eat. Then they would be false fed. So it's it's based in something real, but it's the story is apart from Christabel Pankhurst and the Titanic, pure fiction. You see what I mean? Um, so what I'm trying to say is it's always an admixture, and that's. So, um, in all these literary case studies, it seems like all the examples that you give, it, it still feels perfectly binary to me. Um, <laughs> so what I mean is that it, just, it seems like there are real things and there are things that aren't real. There are things that, that oh. are, you know, um, it seems like our language is, I guess what I'm getting at is like, it seems like our language is perfectly well equipped to say that, you know, um, that, that there, are, there are real things, there are fictional things, they, they can share such and such sets of properties. Um, and nowhere do I need to appeal to degrees. So I'm wondering what's deficient in, oh. in my conceptual framework that I requires. So. I don't know anything's deficient in your conceptual framework. Um, so what would I? I'm, so I'm withholding judgment for the other. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> look, uh, I'm not saying for a moment. Um, if you ask me, um, how come King Arthur is partly real, and what about it isn't real? That I can't answer that question. I can answer that. Only, only to a limited degree of certainty because, of course, the sources are pretty old and pretty ratty. But to a reasonable degree of certainty, I can tell you, look, this was the situation in Britain. These were the people who were eyeing the place and thinking, this is a potentially wealthy island, it would be a useful colony for us. And there is fairly strong historical evidence of someone who pulled the people together enough to fight those, those guys off. It was not a country. It was a bunch of tribes, usually at war with each other, but one gun. That's history. That part's, I take it, true, and what it describes is real. Okay, now I've finally got to why I wouldn't, wouldn't answer your question quite directly. But the rest of this story um, enters the picture only with this poem by Jeff, Jeffrey of Monmouth. And subsequently gets itself embroidered and embroidered and embroidered and embroidered. Mm. But, um, by some extraordinary coincidence, yesterday on television they actually showed a cartoon King Arthur story with all sorts of new embroidery. Um, you understand? I'm not saying I can't tell you which bits are which. I'm just saying I'm confident that there are elements which are rooted in fact and elements which are not. That's all. And that's all I need for this thesis, which is not nearly as scary as it sounds at first. And I'm, I'm kind of getting concerned that you're not, this is not personal, 
You do generally. Okay, then I know the thing about fiction really shook me up when I first thought of it. I you know, had one of those two weeks depressions of ink. I've been wasting my time for a decade on this stuff. It must be all wrong. What did I do wrong? Where did I go wrong? It might have been 15 years ago. Oh, hell. But what I'm, what I'm, the larger picture I'm trying to draw is this. <coughs> there is an enormous universe. Perhaps there are many. I don't know. I have no idea, really. I know some cosmologists speculate there are many. In one corner of one of these universes, there's the Earth, on which there are people, okay, and other living things. And certainly in this corner, maybe in other corners elsewhere, I have no idea about that either, but at least in this corner, there is a natural reality which is overlaid, first of all, by all kinds of artifacts. You know, we have changed the landscape in, just, just in, in, in so many ways that one of the most speechless trying to describe them. And moreover, we have introduced social institutions, ways of living together, rules about how to behave, all of which are real. No, I mean, if you run into the law, you discover the law is real. In some sense, it's an abstraction, but in another sense, it's very real. It has a heavy hand that gets you on the shoulder if you do something bad. Um, great thing about the US legal system is most of us don't have to have anything to do with it most of the time. That make, that's a good, a good legal system if you don't have much to do with it. You see what I mean? A legal system that works with most people having nothing much to do with it is a good one. Anyway, I'm digressing. And then there are all the works of the intellect, all the theories, all the histories, all the criticisms. And there's all the work of the imagination. And this is all overlay on something natural. And the, the thing I'm trying to get across, which is hard to articulate, is it's all an outgrowth of something natural. That's why I said it's all physics. It's all physical. It's not all physics, but it's all physical. There isn't anything non-physical going on. There's nothing spooky going on. But there is intense elaboration on top of the natural. And the business about fiction and fictional characters, which I find endlessly interesting, in part because I just love reading novels, and in part because it simply is so interesting, what iterations and twists and turns you know what I mean? The, the imagination is kept. But this is only part of the big structure of there's nature, stuff, rocks, rivers, and so on. Then there are creatures like us, and we create more physical things, and all kinds of social, intellectual, imaginative things as well. All an outgrowth of something entirely natural, which is why I see this as unified, but not reduction. You, you see what I'm trying to do is to sort of build up a picture of layer upon layer. Um, none of it reductionist. Acknowledging all the richness and the plurality, but not dividing it up into little bits so that you can't understand how they relate to each other. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm just to a follow up, I think. Um, but first, I just want to get clear. Um, you, you gave this definition earlier, but I didn't quite get it out exactly. Uh, you said exactly what it meant to be imaginary, which seems very helpful because that's mm -hmm. what we're going to use to understand what it, mm -hmm. what it is to be real. Mm -hmm. um, it was something like there's something that's up, to, that's entirely up to the creator. Or something that's like right. That. How it how it is depends on how, how we is. make it, okay. what we think about it. Yes. Okay. Uh, but individual, will be individual thinker, or what? Um, you or I or anyone was the phrase I used. Ah, but but, it's, but it's, it's individuals as opposed to like the real but socially constructed things. Which okay, are, the real but socially constructed things are not going to be individuals. Right. Exactly. That, yes. Yes. Right. yes. That was like yes. 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 Um, yes. So I I don't know if this is quite what Chris was getting at, but I think this might have been what he was getting at. Um, so far, it seems like there might still be a sense in which, or, but maybe it's also going to help clarify. The, the, the notion that these things can come in degrees. Um, it seems like we could, maybe the question would be, what would be the mistake in saying that these fictions, these real fictions, mm -hmm. right, that are mm -hmm. um, 
have some elements that are entirely real and some elements that are entirely fictional and no elements that are either, right? So you have the okay. entirely real people. And it, yes. My suspicion was maybe it's like the something still up to, the, to, to, to an individual, but okay. there's something that's yes. just, but I wasn't Good. sure if I was getting at. Okay. Um, you've clarified something. I mean, you made, you made me understand the previous question better, which is helpful. And you've made me realize also why there's a bit of slippage in my paper, which I'm aware of. And I let it go for the moment because I didn't know how to fix it, but now I'm seeing. Um, I initially talked about degrees of reality and fictionality. And then I began to talk about the partly real and the partly fictional. I now think the latter vocabulary is better because that enables the binary thing that you were worried about to be frankly acknowledged. <laughs> while nevertheless making the point that's important to me, namely that you can't necessarily take a thing and say, this is real or this is fictional, because the answer may be this is partly one and partly the other. And that might be better than the talk of degrees. That, sound, that sounds right. I think you're going to end up with something that's more parsimonious on the whole, because now I, I, I was simply asking, why, why, why isn't an account that doesn't appeal to degrees of reality. Yeah, um, so. I have a sort of weakness for degrees of stuff, probably due to Peirce's cynicism, but I think in this case, partly this and partly that is better. Because it is, um, what's the word? The word I'm looking for is decomposable into the elements, right? I can tell you what's the story about, um, what's true about where rummage is and what's pure fiction. I can tell you what the truth is about where Euphoric State University is located and what's pure fiction. So it's decomposable, which means parts is better than degrees. Um, you understand I started with that definition and then had to amend it, right? Because the first, the first emendation was this thing with King Arthur. The second is Social constructivism is not necessarily opposed to realism, to a kind of realism. It depends on the social constructivism and it depends on the realism. But that meant more tinkering with the definition of real, which is a word I think people sort of take for granted. It's, doesn't it sort of seem like an easy word? And then when you try to spell out what it means, you get all sorts of tangles. Anyway. Yes? Um, I wanted to ask about. Uh, the definition of fictional as, I know you repeated it mm -hmm. just a dozen, but I, I'm yeah. not sure, I'm still not sure that I, it was dependent upon the creator. Um, no, not, not that no, exactly. That was my, creator was my one. That was yeah, but can I, can I, you use the word creator too. Um, the, the, the terminology actually comes all the way from Scotus, I believe, via Peirce. Um, and the way Peirce puts it is the a thing which is a figment fiction um, is however its creator makes it. That's to say it has the properties that the creator gives it. Um, this is not perfect, but it's not bad. It's a heck of a lot better than mind independent or independent of us. It's a step in the right direction, is my idea. And it it opens itself to certain sorts of um, expansion, which I think would be desirable if one could get a grip on all of this. Um, think, for example, of, um, do, you, do you know the Inspector Morse series on public television? Mm -hmm. no. Okay, there were awfully good detective stories written by Colin Dexter, featuring an, an Inspector Morse. Um, I used to love these because Morse's hobby is, is crosswords. This is the analogy that informs evidence of inquiry. So anyway, um, shown on PBS, John Shaw, John Thor plays Morse, and the young man's name I've forgotten plays his sergeant, Sergeant Lewis, who was a sort of fall guy. Then Thor dies, Te Dexter's long gone. And there's a new series called Inspector Lewis, and it's the, young, the actor who was a young man, was the sergeant, is now the inspector, and he's old and crabby, and he has a young sergeant who is obviously, you see what I mean? So it's not one creator. It starts with Dexter, 
then the television producers get hold of it. And then there's a, another series. Um, and you see what I mean? A yeah, fictional yeah. thing. Think of fan fiction. Uh, you know, The Martian Mr. Darcy. Or oh, you, you, you know the kind yeah. of thing. Um, so this, this sounds like, a, like almost like a process definition of what it is to be unreal. Um, the no, because it's about the, it's about the it's about the upshot. Because the thing is, as the creator imagines it. See, what I worry about is suppose I make something up that happens to exist. Ah, yes, that is an interesting question. Um, you can do that. Um, if your goal is to write fiction, unfortunately, you're a big flop. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, but this is actually kind of interesting. I, I went into this quite a lot in defending science because I was, I was interested in the relation between science and literature. And they both require imagination, for example. Mm -hmm. Neither would be possible without imagination. And the best way I could put it was something like this. Look, um, what a scientist imagines is explanations, laws, generalized phenomena that might explain particular things and events. And if he's successful, the things he imagines are true. The explanations turn out to be true and the phenomena turn out to be real. Yes, that's what success is in the scientist. Whereas if you're a novelist, you imagine people, scenarios, events, reactions, blah, blah, blah. and if you're successful, they're illuminating about real human beings and what makes them tick. But if it turns out, you know, you've imagined a family named Jones who lives at this address in this city, and the father works as a baker, and the mother is a cleaner in the local primary school, and bloody, bloody, blah, blah, and it turns out there's exactly such a family, well, then it's not fiction at all, after all, despite your intentions. And so, <coughs> um, it's not that you couldn't get caught out when you thought you were imagining something. If you see what I mean, it's not just imaginary, it turns out there was one. But isn't there a sense of the, in which the Joneses both were and were not, however I could? Yes, there is a sense. You could say, look, well, look, there are the imagined Joneses. Um, so far as the inventor knew, they were just purely imaginary. But turns out, you know, there, re there really is a family who lives in Springfield on Evergreen Terrace and the wife really does have blue hair and et cetera, et cetera. Right? Well, that would be very surprising. But, yeah, yeah. but it's exactly this sort of funny case that makes you think about you know, the difference is not easy to get a philosophical grip on, mm -hmm. is it? I mean, we don't, no, <laughs> you see, that kind of case will stand in the way of anything simple, I want to say, about what makes it fictional. And it's right that it should, because what being fictional is, is in that way not simple. And the more I think about this, the more amazed I am by the, the twists and turns the imagination takes. You know? Any of you familiar with the television series Colombo? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it probably dates us, but some of us know this. I didn't know this until recently. You know, he's forever talking about, I said to my wife, or my wife said to me, but you never meet the wife. Well, guess what? There are three episodes starring Mrs. Columbus. Who knew? <laughs> but this is the, the imagination turning back on itself. You, you, you see what I mean? So it's, it's, it's all, I'm not really going, God, I, time, sometimes, some days of the week, I think, I know what happened to Heidi. It's too exciting, for stuff. You know, once you really begin to see a bigger picture, it's, it's really so exciting you can get very confused. But let me, let me go back again. There's the natural stuff, and then there, there's us. We are natural creatures. Right? We somehow have you know, bigger brains than other creatures. We're not very fast, but we're smarter. And we create artifacts, physical and non-physical. And the non-physical ones can be intellectual, like a, a scientific theory, or imaginative, like a novel, and they can play off each other. And this, this is, and it's capable of almost endless iteration, it now seems. 
Um, while I, you know, I started in this game, you know, really fairly obsessed with nominalism versus realism, and science would be impossible if there weren't real kinds of laws. That was how I started. And gradually, as I proceeded, it, it became clear that the world is a much more complicated place than I ever dreamt. And yet it's still unified. It's not, you know, it's a pluralistic universe. It's not three worlds or five worlds or ten worlds. It's a universe, but intensely various in ways that we need to understand. You, you see what I mean? You, you, you begin to see this, I'm getting, I'm getting visionary in my old age, I think. I'm beginning to see a world which is both enormously complex and various and multi-layered in interesting ways, and yet is all clearly, in some sense, one. What was the but sense in which it was one? It's one, it's one in the sense that I'm not postulating, for example, any mental substance or any spiritual substance. There's only one kind of stuff. There's just stuff and us. And what we do with the stuff, like make bonds of water and tables and buildings and things, and what we do with our intellects and our imagination, which of course itself results in some physical things like books, journals, but also results in mental products, also real, and also part of one world, because products of us, like a chrysalis is a product of a caterpillar. You see what I mean? So it's, it's one in the sense that it all stems from the... That's right. The That's right. It's got one it root in some sense. Yeah. Yes. Um, that's right. That's exactly right. It's one, but it's pluralistic. And I guess I'm now getting the feeling that metaphysicians on the whole have either gone for the one or gone for the pluralism. And with the possible exception of William James, whose phrase I borrowed, the pluralistic universe, haven't worked so hard at how it fits together, which is what fascinates me now. But there might be numbers, right? That's what you were oh, no, no, Nothing like I don't want to say about numbers. Isn't, no that, isn't that, like, I don't do metaphysics, so this is out of my way, but mm -hmm. isn't that like really like where, where his, the shit is the fan? Now you gotta tell you gotta cough up are there numbers around there. Oh, <laughs> Isn't that true, Dustin? No, it's not that's not where the, the shit gets the fan all over the place. <laughs> For anything anything you can look, anything you can come up with in such a theory there has to be room for. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, the things I haven't come up with an, an, an account of yet are for me the embarrassing things. I, I don't know what yes, yeah. I don't know what to say about numbers. I simply don't know what to say. Um, I don't know what to say about moral values. I don't know what to say about epistemic values, which is even more embarrassing to me, actually, um, since you know epistemology was primarily what I did for many many years. But yes, any any. Anything is fair game. You can throw anything at me and say, can you fit these into your picture? And if I say, not yet, which is what I have to say about numbers, then you can say, well, your theory is not yet complete. And I will say, of course not. No, it's not. And I when, I, when I figure this one out, I'm sorry about the pun that was not intentional, it just slipped out. When I figure out what to say about numbers, um, it will be more complete, but there will be things left over. Um, Hers had a really interesting idea about numbers, but I don't know if it's right. And that is that what you're doing when you do mathematics is performing operations on imagined diagrams in your head. Um, so he thought, as Frege ultimately did, I believe, as a very old man, that all this necessary reasoning is at bottom geometric. It's to do with space and shape. 
Um, that's a really interesting idea, but I don't know whether I can, whether it's right. I just don't know. Um, by the way, what they were all worried about in Bonn, I turned out to be on the wrong train entirely. Um, turned out what they meant by the new realism was the post-postmodern realism. And interestingly enough, what was really bothering them was moral realism. Because what they feared with some justice was that postmodernism had kicked away the underpinnings of, of moral and political principles. And they were looking for something to restore them. So there wasn't much help on that part, I'm afraid there wasn't much to say about language. But yes, look, you know, the shit's in my fan all over the place. Anything you can throw at me, I can't explain. My bad, because it's supposed to belong in this theory somewhere. <laughs> and the best I can say is I'm working on it. Every now and then I wake up in the night and think about numbers, and then I think, no, it's too hard to go back to sleep. One other question, this is going in a slightly different direction. Um, you said, at some point you said, you don't want to buy into this idea that there's one true description of capital letters. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the next slide, I think you said there are many different descriptions of the world. Mm -hmm. And I wondered in what sense, what, what the word different there meant so as to contrast with the one true description of capital letters. Oh, well, one true description is not my idea, it's Putnam's. Yeah. And I never quite know what Putnam means. I'm not sure he does. You know? Fair um, he's a very slippery, slippery character. He's a nice guy, but he's a very slippery <laughs> philosopher. Um, uh, what I'm thinking is something like this. Um, imagine a book, any book, doesn't matter. Okay. Um, the first copy off the press of the Romanian edition of Evidence and Inquiry, for example. Right? Think of the ways in which you could describe it. Well, you could describe it in terms of its content, of the consequences of its contents, right? which would be infinitely long, no doubt, right? of the production, the color, nature of the paper, the nature of the ink, the color of the cover, what the cover's made of, in terms of the origins of the words in this language, which are, you know, what's the Romanian word for inquiry? The Romanian word for evidence is recognizable, the Romanian word for inquiry is not. Um, you can imagine descriptions down to the molecule of the paper. You can imagine descriptions of how this came to be, right? Of what its influence is or isn't in Romania. Oh, you, you, you see what I mean? In principle, I think there's no limit to how many ways you could describe. And this is just one book. <laughs> and indeed, no doubt you could do the same with one page of the one book, if you put your mind to it. And the idea that all of these descriptions are somehow, the idea that Putnam has, I think, or the idea that he's attributing to someone he calls the metaphysical realist, is that somehow or other there's a description in terms of, of atoms and molecules and maybe hadrons and whatevers, such that if you had that, everything else would be reducible to it. And that seems to me to be about as obviously false as a claim could be. And the idea that you might explain you know, the logical consequences of the claims made in this book in terms of the molecules of the paper it doesn't make any sense. But that's what he's thinking. And what I'm thinking is, for anything, any of this, we, we could, there are infinitely many descriptions we could make. Um, and that, that doesn't mean that the world isn't in any way unified, it's just all over the place. No, it just means that you have to understand how the different layers of description fit together. And there are more ways of fitting together than being reducible to. I guess that's sort of the bottom line. Um, fitting together is a more general concept than reducible to. And I think the metaphysical realist, if there ever were any, I'm not sure this isn't a mythical figure, but 
metaphysical realists, supposing that there are some, have a rather narrow sense of fitting together. And one of the things I'm trying to do is to say something broader about what fitting together might mean. So, um, I don't know that I believe this, but to push on this just a little bit, mm -hmm. I don't think I believe it, but to push on it a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea is that you can have not just a, presumably not just a description of the book, because the logical consequences of the claims would depend on the claims being made in the content. Mm -hmm. um, and that, while depending in part on the physical, they, like the arrangement yes, of the game, depend depends on other things. On other things like, yeah, various linguistic practices mm -hmm. and all this. Um, but the idea is that, I, 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 I take it the idea would be, if you had some complete physical description of everything, you could, with a whole lot of effort, identify all your build build up from that. Mm -hmm. Identify yes. two, two yes. relations, and that's what you're denying. You're denying I'm denying that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, put that way, it doesn't look obvious anymore. Right. 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 Which is a good thing, because right. otherwise it would be not worth defending. Yeah. Right. Um, but okay, a lot of this is to do with. Um, okay. Many years ago, when I was writing *Evidence Inquiry*, one of the bunches of people I had in my way was the early Stitch and the Churchlands, who claimed that there are no beliefs, and consequently, there's nothing for epistemology to be about. Right. Um, now. You know, it was easy enough to show that their arguments are just you know, whopping great strings of non sequiturs. They're terrible. You know, they're just dreadful. The int introspection is fallible. Therefore, there are no beliefs. People with Alzheimer's have, don't really have beliefs. Therefore, there are no beliefs. Babies don't really have beliefs. Therefore, there are no beliefs. It's really terrible stuff. That was easy. But there's a big, horrible question waiting around the corner. Well, okay, but what are they? You know, what, what, what does it mean to believe something? And a good deal of this actually grows out of my thinking on that question. Yeah. Um, because it's very clear that for about the Churchlands, for example, I mean, they're atheists about them. What kind of atheists are they? Well, they're smooth reductionist atheists. If beliefs can't be re smoothly reduced to brain states, then there aren't. And this set me thinking about, you know, what the hell is it to believe something? I don't really like talking in terms of beliefs as opposed to believing something. I think that's better. What is it to believe something? Well, in the first instance, it's some very complicated disposition to behave, both verbally and non-verbally. Um, if I believe the ice on the lake is thick enough to bear my weight, I will only say that the ice is thick enough to bear my weight. If I need to get to the other side in a hurry, I will walk across it. But that can't be all there is to it. In a black, black box behaviorist account, one well, wash. So, well, it's got to be realized somehow, physically. And I take it, you know, probably in here, probably not in the left big toe probably in the brain and the nervous system. Well, how are we realized? Well, I guess in connections between whatever takes in input and whatever produces output in the form either of words or other behavior. Okay. What's that got to do with what it is that you believe? I mean, this story doesn't tell me anything about the content of and so the final picture is, well, connections get set up in the brain of each individual person as they learn a language in the first place between certain words and certain things, like dog and dogs. So. And it turns out, actually, there's a, there's a very minimal, tiny little bit of empirical work that confirms this. Not any particular kind of neuron that lights up when you see a picture of Homer Simpson in Homer Simpson. But in every person, a neuron that lights up, that's associated with the words Homer Simpson and with that particular figure. 
and with two, and so on. You see what I mean? Uh, so generic bits of brain, right, connected in the history of the individual with words, which are connected in the history of the culture and the language with the world. Okay, now that begins to tell a story about why this might be a belief that dogs have four legs, for example. Yes? Now the question is, okay, but what makes it possible for me and a monolingual Chinese speaker to have the same belief then? Because there are no connections to any English words in his brain and no connections to Chinese words in my brain. So there's got to be more to this story. And my answer was, well, there are similarities between the connections between this Chinese word and this thing in the world, and this English word and this thing in the world. And he's got the same sorts of patterns in his brain as an English speaker would who believed that dogs had four legs or that snakes are dangerous or whatever. Um, this, of course, is only as good as the similarities between languages. Right. And since I think of a language as something like a sort of big conglomerate of close enough idiolects, not really a single thing, um, I don't really believe in strict synonymy. I believe only in similarity of meaning. But I think that consequence is actually good rather than bad for this reason. That there are differences between languages, even sometimes reasonably close ones, which make one hesitate to say quite whether they have exactly the same belief as me or not because the linguistic apparatus is subtly different in a way that seems to preclude them quite believing that. You, you see what I mean? So I'm thinking, for example, of all those verbs in Spanish that are reflexive. You know, the thing permits itself. Say permite. Right? Well, what the... <laughs> you know, there are some things that I can imagine a Spanish speaker accepting, but I can't quite get my brain around because the English is too different in this respect. And that's a very, very simple example because my linguistic skills are relatively limited. So this all, this all began in some funny way, with me worrying about what the hell is going on with beliefs. But if you can get a grip on what it is to believe something which doesn't, doesn't, isn't reductionist, isn't atheist right? and isn't spooky, right? doesn't require any peculiar stuff floating about, then that's the first move towards understanding how one of the layers comes on top of the natural. And all I'm, what I'm, part of what I'm doing is extrapolating from there. Right? So I think. I certainly agree that the story that that story isn't reductionist in the sense of reducing to like brain states, reducing right. things like that, right? Right. Um, but it seems to me that the broader like this might not be any person's view either, right? Maybe mm -hmm. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. but, but the 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 broader thing, of, the broader worry that was in the back or worry not right, but the broader idea that was floating in the back of my mind was it seems like it's still possible that this could all be reducible to ah, like yes. some complete, some, some, some broader description, maybe not of the entire universe, but at least of lots of different physical features of people yes. and their histories. And yes, um, that's, and that's a question about whether you think that history is somehow reducible to physics. But I think of this story as inherently historical. Absolutely. Yes. Um, Socio-historical, I would say, if I was trying to be more accurate. And I think that this is too, you know, the, the, this is just too full of singularities to be reducible to physics. By uh, singularity, you mean? I mean, um, well, I mean sort of like evolution is full of singularities. You know, there's this little niche, so this is why we have this creature. Um, I'm thinking of the evolution of social institutions. I'm thinking of a cookery book I once read, a cookery book, a book about food. Um, I tell this story to my law students, and there's a moment of silence, and then they laugh. I wonder, I wonder what will happen if I tell it to you. 
The author of this book, who's a history teacher, tells the following wonderful story. She's British. Um, her mother taught her how to cook roast beef. First you cut a thin slice off the end of the joint. Then you weigh it. Then you cook it for n, degree, uh, n minutes at, per pound at m degrees if you want it rare, at m plus 5 degrees if you want it medium rare, and so on. And she said she'd done this for many years. And then one day she said, why on earth do I cut this slice off? So she called her mother. And her mother said, I don't know, but my mother always cut this off. Let's call your grandmother and see if she can remember. So they called the grandmother. And she said, oh, I had a very small arm. Well, you know, history is kind of like that. <laughs> you, you see what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, there are these, that's what I meant by singularity. You have a very small oven, so you get this practice of cutting a slice off the joint. Um, the law is like this. Very interesting. You can sort of watch it happening, and it's fascinating. Um, which is why, after a minute, my students laugh, because after a minute they see what I'm getting at. First, they think I'm just weird. Um, but if I uh, well, uh, told basically the same story in one of my classes a little like, you're okay, you're right, it's great. Yeah. 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 It's great. It's great, it's a great story. Um, okay, so if that's right, and if history is like this, then it's not going to be reducible to physics. That's the point. It's physics isn't going to tell you where the singularities come from. Um. Okay, you're still trying to reduce it. I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure it can be reduced, but yeah. I, I yeah okay, look. But that, but that, that, that's, anyway, that, I, I see. I see where that was going. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, okay, so I see where you're going. But, I see that making a watertight argument here would be extremely hard. Right. Either way. Actually. My my hunch is. Yeah. Look, I mean, I, I have to admit, some of what I do in philosophy, I do sort of by hunch. That's to say, I know. Whichever, whatever view I take on this, I'm taking a bet on which is the more, the more insoluble problem. You know, if you go this way, you're going to get that problem. If you go this way, you'll get that one. Yeah. And often, I just have a gut feeling that this one, with enough work, is soluble. Right. And that one is just going to stop me dead. And I'm kind of doing that here. It certainly seems very unlikely that anybody would tell a story about how it's going to be done. Yeah, exactly. it's it's no, I agree. More yeah. likely to do this and say, well, in principle, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, no. Yes. Um, if only we still had Carnap. <laughs> he would say, OK, well, if it's possible in principle, let's do it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and rewrite the alphabet, and I could start all over again. Where I came in. Yes. So I have a question. Um, so when you first started out, I thought that um, well, at first, I like many people, I was trying to figure out what your basic claim is about there being one real world. Mm -hmm. But in response to some of the questions, it seems to me like what you're talking about is physicalism. Um, so you're saying at root, everything is physical or physiological, mm -hmm. and I take it that you don't want to reduce everything to that. No. But there are forms of physicalism that are non-reductive. Oh. And you even mm -hmm. use language realized. Oh. At one point, okay, yes, yes. the physical and the physiological realize everything else. So this yes, yes. this sounds to me like you're endorsing some form of physicalism. And um, if that's true, and if you're trying to avoid hard problems, I'm afraid you're going to face the hard problem. Which hard, hard problem? Hard problem of consciousness. Ah, um, my view is, if I can deal with belief, I, I mean, I think this is just mythology that that's hard. Well, right? You know, what I mean? okay, I mean, that's a hunch, right? I always thought the really, really hard problem in the philosophy of mind is what on earth is involved in believing something? This is hard. Um, I don't feel nearly the same way about, maybe this is just ignorance on my part, or I don't know. But my, okay, my sense is that this, this is not, in a certain sense it is physicalism. Right? I said it's all physics. And I didn't say it's not all physics, but it's all physics. It's not reducible to, but it's, it's not reducible to, but there's no, no other sort of stuff about it. Right, that was the point. Um, I think, actually, if I may look in your direction, um, I'm more scared of numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's hard. But that's, you know, this is speculation about what if I were to live to 300. 
um, I might be able to lick and what will probably will probably escape me even if I live that long. Um, I don't know why, but for some reason it's always been belief that bugged me. What, what's going on? Maybe it's, maybe it's the fault of living next door to a, living in an office next door to a Popperian for 20 years. You know, they don't believe in belief either. And that's all the big muddle about the objective. You know, so for many, many years I've been worrying about belief and somehow when I thought I'd got a grip on it, maybe not a perfect grip, but you know, a significant grip, you know, enough of a theory to look seriously plausible, then it wasn't consciousness that was bothering me. I was being woken up by numbers a lot more often. Why? It's worth. <laughs> I, I think they are. I would be woken up by numbers too, because that's one of the, the most difficult challenges for physicalists. Um, I think so, yes. But the hard problem is also hard, I think. Oh, well, yeah, okay, look, when I know. I, it's just that this is... <laughs> I, I guess, I guess, yeah. well, I, don't, I don't know, you know what I mean? Um, I suspect a certain amount of, of PR in this process, you know, because the one that we're working on, this is the big one, guys, the rest of you just piddling around in the foothills, right? Um, and I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm not quite sure I understand what the problem is, so that that's probably why I'm not so troubled yet. You see what I mean? Yeah. You know, people say to me, what about consciousness? And I say, well, look, you know, I know the difference between a dog that's conscious and a dog that's been knocked out for an operation. So that's, that's one sense hard. of consciousness, perhaps, mm -hmm. being awake or not being yeah, awake. Yeah, I mean, that's... <coughs> it's that's phenomenal consciousness, mm -hmm. that's yeah. the hard... Um, well, yeah, but maybe the problem is I don't quite understand what that is. But maybe that's because philosophers of mind haven't explained it to me yet. Well, I can try. I don't know if mm, now's the time, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, should I? Try. Um, Maybe I'll be as scared of this as I am of numbers. Keep well, me on so, my toes. So the, the catchphrase is that there's something that's like to have some of our experiences. Um, I don't know that that's the best phrase, but that's one way that Frank Jackson like. uh, tries to get at it like that. Um, but my preferred way of describing it is as um, our experience understood in a first-person way. Um, so there's a perspective that we have when you undergo a particular experience. There are qualities of which you're immediately aware in that experience. Mm -hmm. um, and so it has very much to do with the first-person perspective. Um, and you can say there's something that's like because... Um, we have a vocabulary for these things, so it can't be in principle unshareable, can it? Um, well, that depends on what you mean by shareable. So I think that I can have an experience that's qualitatively identical to yours. Sure. But it's not clear that you and I can have numerically the same. Oh, well, of course we can't. No, I mean, so that, not I can sharing. remember trying to explain this to logic students a long time ago. Um, the time you could put, use examples like this and say, look, it's perfectly possible to say, Catherine and I to go to a party and we're wearing the same dress. Uh, very embarrassing, but it's, yeah, it's possible. We know what it means. Right? No problem. But of course, we're not wearing numerically the same dress. Right? Um, I think when I was trying to figure this out, I was, I was trying to explain it to, to students what, what it was that Frege was saying to Locke and how Locke might have replied. You, you see what I mean? I mean, I think Locke would have replied, I never said you were wearing the exact numerically same <laughs> dress. Uh, size extra, extra, extra large to fit you, but no, I'm just, you have, I have an idea in my mind and my word evokes a similar one in yours, that's the problem. Um, no, so I wasn't meaning shareable in that, that logically impossible sense, I meant it in the logically well, possible sense. Well, it might sense. be logically possible, but I people know, tend to assume that you and I cannot share numerically the same experience. Well, well, I think I've totally okay. It yeah. entirely depends on what criteria you set for individuating experiences, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm inclined to set them, I think, the same way as you. So that if it's yours, it isn't mine. Yeah, that's okay with me. Yeah. Um, so if you're thinking about consciousness like that, mm -hmm. phenomenal consciousness, qualitative consciousness, call it what you will, mm -hmm. then the hard problem is to explain that, like why it should exist. You can ask, why should I, why should you be conscious at all in that way? Or you can ask, why should you have the specific conscious state that you do right now? And you can ask whether that can be explained mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of the physical. Mm -hmm. um, 
So if everything is realized by that, um, it would be nice if we could say it's nice if we could say how, yes, it would. Yeah. Yes. And that, that problem yes, is very Yes, I don't hard. yet quite have a grip on what it is I'm trying to explain, I have to admit. Um, so just focus on your experience now. Mm -hmm. um, there's something that's like for you to undergo that experience. Um, why should there be something that's okay, like? Well, I can, I can imagine describing it to you, but that can't be right because if it, insofar as I can do that, it's not hard, right? Um, a much of the description would be in terms of what I'm looking at and what I'm hearing, um, and that's not hard. Um, so what's this, what's it like that's over and above, um, well, there's this sort of fundamentally grey carpet that's kind of striping with a lot of coloured spots, and uh, a faint hum from the lighting, and what, what over and above that? What is this, what's it like? Yeah, so it seems like whatever physical description you try to give of it, whatever explanation that you try to give, if it's purely physical, it seems you can imagine that same, very same physical system with all the same features, but no consciousness. And if that's correct, if you can really conceive of that, then it seems like you don't have an explanation yet. Um, okay. And that's a hard problem. Okay. Um, Closing that gap. So it's yes. called this is, this is not an answer. This is a response. Different thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I think what you just said, which clarified what the problem was supposed to be considerably, um, raises questions in my mind about the relation between the conceivable and the real, about which I have nothing to offer at the moment. You see, that, that was the part of what you said that made me go, ah, yeah, okay, there's, there are issues here that you could get your teeth into. Right? We can conceive of this, but could it happen? I don't know. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'm already worried about the conceivable because, of course, um, I'm, I've been sort of edging up to mine off, as you noticed. Right? And I think it's actually true that there are objects of which it's true that there are no such objects. Right? It's, there, there are imagined people of which it's true that there are no such people for example. Um, but I, I've got a problem about whether we can actually imagine impossible things. I don't, I don't know what to say about that. And that's, you know, in, in a way, a related problem to the one that you've just helpfully suggested to me. Might be where I could get a grip on the issue that's you know, it's never quite grabbed me before, but now I begin to see what's going on. Okay. I have no answer. Well, no one does. So. No, no, no. <laughs> but as far as I know, no one else does about beliefs. So. <laughs> you know, I might have managed it, but no such luck. I haven't really worked on it. Just to, I simply haven't. If you're an epistemologist, it's belief that bugs you. Um, I guess once I licked beliefs, I was so happy. Um, and sufficiently confident that this was, in principle at least, extrapolatable to other propositional attitudes that I haven't worried about consciousness for a while. <laughs> you know, preferring to be unconscious in the dentists, but that's not worrying about consciousness in your sense. <laughs> ah. Yes. Yeah. Shall we let our speaker off the hook? <laughs> All right, let's see.